This is the Iron Sharpens Iron Movement, sharing insights into the power of people-centric leading. Hi, this is Jim, and today we welcome to our tribe an IO psychologist and HR thought leader with over two decades of field experience. She serves as the founder and principal consultant to a boutique management consultancy focused on changing the status quo of work. She is also the founder of The Whirling Chief, a global digital collaboration and learning platform championing humanity in the global workplace. She's an active contributor to Forbes, has been published in Harvard Business Review, the HR Zone, and the UK's HR Magazine. This is Cecil Pear. The Iron Sharpens Iron movement is brought to you by N2 Growth, a leader in executive search, leadership development, and talent management. We find and develop the world's best leaders. Learn more about our practice by visiting us at n2growth.com or click on the link in the show notes of this podcast. Ceso, welcome to the Iron Sharpens Iron movement. I know our tribe is going to learn so much from you today. You have a world and worldly amount of knowledge that uh, we are just going to dig into. So again, welcome to the tribe. Thank you very much for having me, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, one of the things that attracted me to you was the fact of you are not shy at all about being very upfront on uh, human-centric leading, the importance of human-centric leading, about how today's organizations need to understand the value of human-centric leading. And it's not a very common term. Now, I will tell you, most of the listeners in this audience are very much in the human-centric leading, but I would love to know, from your point of view, what is your definition of human-centric leading? Mm, that's a wonderful question. First of all, thank you very much for noticing because I actually take pride in that. Um, um, it's a life mission for me, Jim. That's why I take pride in it. My life's purpose is, as a human being is actually to provide a safe and a loving place for people who enter the path with me. Um, so I've kind of taken that into the workspace uh, with a desire to create these inspirational, meaningful, safe and joyful environments for our employees. Uh, so, you know, when you take your life's mission to what you do, it, it does become sort of a pride point. How I think about human-centered um, organizations, well, first of all, um, Human-centered uh, approach is sort of a design thinking, so it's bigger than what we do. Uh, it's been used in user experience, it's been used in customer experience. But the way I think about it is that organizations are fundamentally living organisms. You know, they are by and large made up uh, of human beings. Uh, and because of that, um, Humans are at the heart of what we do in business. Now, a lot of the organizations sort of realize that, but um, they have an approach to productivity that gets in front of their human-centered approaches. So I try to remind organizations to come back and realize who they are at their core and help them find different paths to productivity. That's sort of how I think about human-centric approach. Do you find that difficult uh, in the early stages of approaching an organization when, uh, if it's, let's say, it's a publicly traded company and they're controlled by their stockholders and they're controlled by their boards and they're after a profit and, uh, you know, they're, they're controlled by the, the essence of business and they find that when you walk in and say, yeah, but it's about the people, what, what what kind of pushback do you normally find? Yeah, another great question. And this is so real, by the way. Uh, it happens almost every time. There are a few times where we either have been referenced somewhere or there has been a pull and there's a specific need they're reaching out to us. So they're more open in terms of hearing what we have to say. But a lot of the conversations actually start at the very top. And the fact is, 
we live in an ecosystem. So our organizations are part of a larger ecosystem. And in that ecosystem, there are a number of things that work against our humanities. Um, so businesses are, you know, traditionally designed with uh, an idea of sort of reaching efficiencies. And because of that, the practices that are built in you know, things like hierarchies, routinization, or top-down leadership, they are serving a sole purpose of making profit. And at the same time, I think what we are realizing, especially now with the change in dynamics, change in the environment, is that those approaches are becoming irrelevant really fast because there's just so much change in the external sphere. So there's almost become a mismatch between you know, what's happening in the broader external environment of business and then what's happening within organizations. There's a tension there, Jim. Uh, when we start talking about that and when we help organizations sort of quantify the amount of resources they're putting in to help their people be successful within this tension, they start understanding maybe there's a different route to do this because essentially... They're hiring all these people, they're putting investment in, they're trying to enable these people, but the way of enablement is actually working against it. So there is resistance in the system. And again, when you sort of start quantifying some of that, uh, it becomes pretty relevant very quickly because they start once again seeing, you know, there may be another way to productivity or there is a gain, of, there's a potential of a gain for efficiency. Um, but uh, the current system, unfortunately, works against. Yeah, it's interesting. You you know, like, like when you said, like um, we're a business is just a part of the bigger you know organism that's out there. Uh, this being of on the planet and how it's all interconnected and everything. And it's really interesting. You know, like you almost go back into Darwinism and you say you know, things evolve, you know, animals evolve and they figure out how to get more lethal and how to survive longer and all that. And I, and as you were talking, I could imagine, you know, the, the corporation, the organization thinking in those same terms too, how do we become more focused in business? How do we become survivable longer? All of those kind of things. And it starts to stray away. It becomes very predatory, right? You know, I mean, it's animalistic in a way, if you think of it um, from this organism point of view. But your perspective is that the heartbeat of whatever this predator is still is the human being. And uh, what's interesting is I, I know Deloitte came out with a white paper last year on how the last 25 years of uh, leadership development has basically failed. Right, all our traditional hierarchical ways that we teach leadership development at certain points in a person's career and all of that really just doesn't get you much farther than it did in the in the past. And your point of view is that's why we have to change things. And I think it's it's interesting that organizations should hopefully be awakened by this. That yeah, they're they're kind of predators and they're trying to you know survive longer and attack harder and all of those kind of things. You can kind of do the final goal of all of that, but like you said, in a safe and a loving place. Mm -hmm. Our motto, you're absolutely right. You know, our motto as a company is to change the status quo work. Hmm. And we have been very thoughtful about that, Jim, because change is a constant in the current environment. And it has been for the last, oh, I want to say at least 10 years. So... You know, you may very well know your business. You may very well um, identify with your core capability, but the reality is someone else may just come along and sweep you from your feet. That's just the reality of business today. So one of the questions that I often ask C-suite is, are you wanting to continue directing the forces of change, which is inevitable and consistent in its going to be ambiguous from day to day, or do you want to shift your status quo? So you could really take your organization and turn it upside down, and perhaps you'll find there's risk resistance, and all of this is an 
individuals start thriving more. So it, it's a different perspective is what I'm trying to say. One, it's one thing to go against the current. The other one is to sort of you know, <laughs> become a boat. So oh, I love that. Uh, I might have to steal that analogy. I love that one. <laughs> yes. So, so, so when you, you have these conversations with senior organizational leaders, uh, do you have some things, one of the things that uh, I think that you help provide the world really on some of the research that you've done is it's not only a feeling, you know, you've, you said you came in and, you know, this is my calling and this is what I believe in, which is all perfect. But yet I can imagine myself if I'm a senior leader going, that's your passion, but show me the evidence, show me the practicality of things. Most of what you actually preach is evident based. Is that correct? That is correct. So it, thank you again for noticing, because that's another point we proud ourselves on. Um, first of all, I consider myself. Uh, a practitioner. You know, I am an industrial and organizational psychologist. A lot of my peers, uh, when we finished our higher studies, went into academia. I've always been a business person at heart, so I actually turned to business. Um, all my time, a total of 22 years now, I have been in practice of either leading organizations or supporting leaders who are sort of in charge of business. So either in a charge space or a business leader myself. Uh, and now in the consulting capacity, because of that experience, when we were sort of establishing our business five years ago, one of the things I said, everything we do has to be evidence-based, meaning there has to be data, there has to be scientific insight, and there has to be testable evidence that's coming from a number of business scenarios and cases that we can share with people. Um, and, you know, it's, it's yet another approach. I'm not here to judge anyone else's approach, but I believe there's enough goodness in the world where people don't have to reinvent the wheel. And our job as, you know, psychologists and practitioners to actually make some of that visible, uh, because there are a lot of good things that are happening across organizations, some conscious, some unconscious, but if we know about it, if it has been tested and if it has been proven, then it's our job to surface that and share that goodness with others. That's how I see it. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic point that, uh, one, it gives you the confidence as a practitioner, right, to walk in and go, you know, this isn't an opinion. It's factually based. Here's the science behind it. Here are the studies. You know, that, that just gives you more confidence. And it, and it my opinion is it, more people would listen to that because they just don't think it's, you know, on a personal point of view. But I also like the fact that, um, you know, when you say these things, it, it's an interesting thing about bringing it to people's attention. You know, people just don't know what they don't know, right? That common phrase. And it's very true in that same study that I was referring to before about how leadership development practices in the last 20 years kind of have failed, Another really interesting aspect of that was mm -hmm. it was senior leaders who were underdeveloped themselves trying to teach younger people to be leaders, but yet they didn't know what they were teaching or what they were exhibiting and how they were performing as an example because they just don't know what they don't know, uh, to your point. Yeah, so what you're saying really resonates with me. First of all, I know the report you're referring to, and I fully agree with Deloitte. I think we have failed our leaders as leadership practitioners because a lot of the learning and development systems that we have built, and, you know, in some ways, that's yeah. the extent, that was the extent of Yeah, I grew up in that so system. Again, you bet. Either, but, 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 you know, they were built on the promise of child development. That's right. <laughs> And we are not children, you know, uh, people who go into the workplace are adults. They may not be through their adult development stages. That's a different conversation, but we're adults. And yet we have been treating people like they're children, and we have been trying to teach them as if they're children. The fact is, children learn in a classroom setting. They take about 80% of the information. Adults? That's amazing. Only Shocking. Only about 10% inside a class. Majority of our learning happens on the job. We are experiential learners. 
And we don't have the design systems to support that. So there's a lot that needs to change. That's one thing. The other thing also resonates with me. The fact is a lot of leaders haven't seen what good looks like. And therefore, they don't know how to coach and be a role model to others. One of the things that I talk about a lot in HR group, groups as a you know, fellow HR professional, it is not okay to ask a person to lead other adults because you wouldn't do that with your child. You wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't just call your neighbor and say, I'm not sure if you've ever been in charge of kids. I haven't seen you around them. I have no idea what your skills are. Oh my goodness. But right. You, <laughs> you would never do that. That's exactly right. Days. So why are we okay doing that with adults? Because at the end of the day, we have a learning brain and we continue to um, take in what we see. We continue to learn, especially from role modeling and also evolve our being with that. So where there is damage in the system, people are actually hurt and then they or know any better, and they continue on with that behavior and continue hurting other souls. So, right, why, it's why amazing. Would, why would we be We're okay almost with blind that? to it. We're <laughs> numb to it, aren't we? We're just. This there is the way we, we've always done it, and this is how we're going to continue. We, we totally are, and there are beautiful maturity models when it comes to leadership. You know, starting with an individual contributor, the kind of skills and behaviors we would want to see there, versus when you get to the top of the, you know, ladder, if you will. I don't. I don't necessarily consider the ladder but you know when you get to leadership it's a whole different thing and every step of the way there are a number of things we would expect to see from people and actually you know the one maturity metrics that we use if you look in the middle there is a very critical step there where the individual contributor has sort of become a value contributor and people start becoming drawn to them so you know if you have a question inside of the office, if you go to Jim, Jim will have an answer and he will be able to point you in the right direction. That's when people start sort of gathering followership, if you will. And from there, we continue growing them. But what, what ends up happening you know, in reality today is we hire someone as an individual contributor out of college. They do a good job with their tasks for about two years. And then we say, you know what? you're pretty smart. Why don't you come and lead this group? And then people in the office may even wonder, why him or her? Why not me? Because I've been here longer. Maybe I'm demonstrating a different kind of skill or different level of maturity. So there are things that we do also from a practice perspective. I think that's a disservice uh, to individuals, both the individual who, who's being promoted into the leadership role, but also the other individuals were actually yeah, that's a fantastic that point. That's a foot stopper for everybody that it works in, you know, talent development, HR, uh, leaders, all of those kind of things. You know, it's something to be very aware of and realize, uh, you know, these these kind of blind spots they have. You know, I've, I've referred to not only the Deloitte white paper, but I also at the very beginning of the podcast referred to your your one of your white papers that you've put out there. And for all our listeners, we'll make sure that uh, the link is absolutely there in the show notes. But, you know, it was on the mindsets, attributes uh, for the future of work. And I think this is a great point to talk about when when you're talking about people being promoted early or why were they why was somebody promoted over? over me and how is that person becoming successful, you actually discover that there's kind of five common leadership behaviors that are out there for um, someone to be a successful human-centered leader in today's environment. I'd like to kind of talk to it, almost kind of like a quiz show with you on, as I throw these out, um, what, these five examples on um, you know what your comments are, how you discovered uh, these five behavioral traits and things like that. So the very first one that you listed was that leaders sit in many chairs. So um, when we just were talking kind of smack about like, hey, don't climb up the traditional pyramid. You know, we've got the ladder. You know, be careful about saying those things. So what do you mean by saying leaders sit in many chairs? Yeah. Um, so just to step back uh, to give a bit of a context, the research that you're referring to has been conducted in partnership with Stanford University. And we studied, you know, there's this data out there. Uh, people may have heard of it. <laughs> It is a true data. Um, so 
since the year 2000, 52% or so of Fortune 500 companies have disappeared. They are either have been acquired or they just went out of business, basically. Um, and one of the things that we got curious about is what happened with the remaining 48%. Um, you know, there's a lot of negative signs out there, and I believe in the power of positive. So we want we wanted to go after people who have been able to sort of make it through the centuries. What are they doing? And are they doing something right? So can we learn from them? Anyway, so 42% makes about, you know, I don't know, several hundreds of them. But oh, wow. I think 118 of them said yes to us. So we reached out to them and said, can we come and study what you're doing? <laughs> can we understand what are some things that are going on inside your organization and maybe we can, you know, learn from them and help other organizations? Anyway, so 118 of them said yes. Um, and we studied these organizations for two years. And you're absolutely right. One of the things that we found out is that there are some common approaches to leadership across the board. So the thinking and behaving happens consciously, others are unconscious, but we were able to see some thread. The first one is leaders sit in many chairs, as you said. So what we found inside these organizations is that leadership as a concept is rarely dedicated to a few at the top. Of course, in many of them, there are hierarchies, don't get me wrong, so from a role in terms of how information flows or how decisions are made, there is a hierarchy, but there isn't a core line be between the levels. Instead, all people, despite whatever tenure or rank they may have, despite the kind of title or the compensation package that's associated with it, they feel and act as leaders. So you may be time higher coming out of the university you're given a job as an individual contributor you have a task or a number of tasks you are trusted to do your job and if you need to make a decision or if you need to spend a little bit of dollar you're empowered to do so so that's very unique uh in the in the way i see it from a traditional perspective of leadership yeah it's interesting john maxwell wrote an entire book on that called 360 degree leading where i i think he was on to your research onto your point about um you know each person needs to believe that no matter where they sit in the organization they can lead effectively they can lead up they can lead across and they can lead down and never really think in terms a high-performing organization should never think in, of in hierarchical terms for their people. And, you know, this fits well because if you look at the evolution of uh, organizations from a modeling perspective, it used to be that we embodied uh, hard hierarchies, you know, say 70 years ago or so. Um, in the closer near term, the last 30 years or so, we've gotten into more of the strategic um, structures, which are semi-hierarchical, there's um, just a bit more flexibility, information floating in you know, multiple ways. But now, when you look at sort of the future organizations, it's very organic, it's dynamic, what we call it distributed organizations. It looks like a brain or the map of an internet. You know, everyone is sort of connected to everyone, there are networks everywhere, and there's information flowing in parallel at any given time, at any given direction. So if you take that model, you kind of need to awaken pot potential everywhere because you know, otherwise you have to ask the question, who is leading here, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So, all right, that's a fantastic segue then. Your second behavioral thing then, when you say, well, who's leading here? Your second behavioral trait that you found successful was leaders lead themselves. Yeah, this is a big one. Um, and I can't tell you <laughs> how happy I was to see this trend because I was really hoping it would be there. <laughs> um, so again, inside these organizations, we found a leader's ability to effectively influence people, large networks of individuals, if you will, actually relies quite heavily on their confirmed level of self-esteem and their willingness to continue gaining more awareness. This is 
huge because what happens a lot of the times inside our organizations, Jen, we look at technical skills. We look at what people are able to do well and assume they're going to be a good role model. Work is one thing. Being with people, relating to people effectively is a whole different story. And for people to be able to focus, to self-regulate, to show presence is so relevant in the new world of work because there's a lot going on. So you're being pulled in a hundred different directions. So we almost need leaders to consciously choose where they're going to spend their time, how they're going to be with their people, and what kind of modeling they're going to demonstrate. So yes, self-leadership actually becomes even more important. I don't think this is new, by the way. That's why I was sort of secretly hoping it would be there. You know, if you go all the way back to the Greek times, you know, um, there, there, there is in the wisdom, in the ancient wisdom, um, this information we have access to that says you have to lead yourself first. And in some ways, this is very associated to that. Um, so again, for me, it's not new discovery, but it's great to know that science supports No, I love it. that. And it, I think it helps lots of people too to realize that it's not being selfish. This is not, this by no means says be selfish and then you will be a great leader. You know, it, it's not that, you know, it's just saying that these behaviors are inherent within you that um, you have to take care of yourself. You have to learn. You have to continue to be the type of example that you want your organizations to be uh, by taking care of yourself. And that that is that is a, um, a responsibility and it's not a level of selfishness at all. Not at all. That's a great point. And let me give um, a specific example here. One of the things that we see most um, uh, with leaders in terms of a potential barrier is that if they don't have the right kind of self-esteem and separation from their work, there has to be a healthy boundary there between how they see themselves and the work that they're leading and the work that's being led by others. If there isn't that kind of a self-esteem and confidence, they can't relate to others from an understanding place. They huh. actually try to control people as if they're controlling their own work. Because the only way they know to be successful is through divide and conquer. You know, they know to task, they divide it into time spans, and then they know they're gonna deliver this, 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 and this you know, in these time periods, they try to take that approach and apply it with people. You can't leave Fantastic people like point. that. That's management. That's work management. You can't people. And so that level of self-esteem becomes really important because you need people to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to give you this task. You may or may not deliver on time. That's going to be on you, not on me. It's not going to reflect on me as a leader. We're going to learn learn through this specific experience together but again that takes a level of maturity but i think i think the earlier you start socializing those ideas and giving examples of those ideas uh the better chances you have of younger leaders to accept that because i think it's just a a natural potentially even a primal instinct to be overly protective Right. You know, this is mine. I've got it. It's my, you know, this has been, you know, my advantage. I will keep it. I will hoard it. Those kind of things. It's almost this primal caveman instinct is to be protective. And we're trying to flip that and go the more that you give away, the more self-confidence that you have that it's all going to be OK uh, and that you expand your networks, uh, the greater you become as a leader. So let me let me dig a little deeper into that for a second. Uh, Cecil, about um, when you talk about self confidence, do you tie that in? My mind, my mind went when you were talking about a, a leader has to have that level of self confidence. They got to feel good about themselves. They've got to, you know, walk tall. Those kind of things. Is that tied into their level of resilience also? 
um, by them taking care of their body, their mind, their soul, is is that interconnected in self confidence? Absolutely, yes, absolutely. You know, the more faith you have in yourself, the more for me it means you understand where your uh, limitations lay. So the more you understand your capability and capacity as a whole, basically, is that is my answer. Uh, because people who understand where their limitations are, and you know, we we as a Western society especially have a negative connotation on limitation. Limitation is not a bad thing. Listen, we all have a body, right? You can push yourself. You can you know try to pretend you don't need sleep, or you can skip one. But at the end of the day. We all need air. We all need to eat. We all need to sleep and poop. That's right. It's, it's God human. There's nothing we can do about it. So we are bound to our limitations, as does organizations, by the way. That's a separate topic. But um, knowing where your limits are actually gives you a choice to say, you know what, this is the best I can do at this given point. So from here on, you have to take it. Or delegate more effectively, rely on others more effectively, you can say, you know what, I'm out of my compassion for today, but I need you to understand that we're going to continue this conversation at another time because I do care. I just yes. can't care more today. You know what I mean? So be able to communicate those limitations, be able to work with them that sort of flexibility actually is what makes leadership successful in my mind. So it's not about perfection because none of us are perfect. Um, it's about being able to work with our imperfections, I guess. So how do you tie that into your next behavioral trait? Because it's so closely connected on winning minds, hands, and hearts. Yeah, um, big topic here. But let me see. So. A lot of our organizations um, play to the mental capacities people have to offer. But, you know, we as individuals thrive at our best when we are provided with holistic experiences. So Mm -hmm. scientifically speaking, Jim, just take a step back. There are four elements to our being as humans. There's the mental being, there's the emotional being, there's the physical being, and then there's the spiritual being. This is a scientific approach. We, all of us, thrive at our best when we are uh, provided experiences that blend those four elements. Now, that's a hard thing to do, but that's where we thrive best. For leaders, what we found inside these organizations, they have sort of demonstrated capacity, if you will, to connect to their inner wisdom and to care equally about providing these sort of holistic experiences for people. Are they perfect? No. But they're able to say, you know what? This person had a terrible week right. because of who knows why, right? Maybe they had a personal circumstance at home. Maybe they had a difficult colleague to work with and in the workplace. So I'm going to give them a little bit of a slack next week and I'm going to take it easy on them. Or, you know, they say things like this person has a sick elderly and they have to be remote because their mind is there already. Their body is in the office, but hey, their soul is gone. So I'm actually going to offer them whether they would like to work remotely for the next couple of weeks so they can go and be with their mom or dad. You know what I mean? So they they are equally about igniting not only the mental capacities of their people, but putting their hands to work, putting their hearts to work. Um, and for me, it's very rational. But- you bet. Uh, it, it's, it's really interesting. My, my key takeaway from what you just talked about on this particular behavior was, you know, mental, you know, uh, emotional, physical, spiritual, um, those traits are very are are the pillars of resiliency, and I used to always just say those are the pillars of resiliency. But I love how you twist it a little bit, and you say this allows you to thrive at your best. 
And I think that's, I think that's a powerful word, right? You know, I think, you know, even me mentally thinking about this, you know, I, I, th- this is a person myself that for 30 years have basically say, has said, you know, be resilient within yourself and within your organization, resilient organizations. But the realities are, it's, it might even be easier to tell somebody, this is how you thrive. This is how you become your best are through these pillars. And uh, I, I love how you, how you bring that uh, to light because I do think that's an important leadership behavior that most people kind of just gloss over. And then, you know, many people uh, in today's society are scared about uh, spirituality as one of those pillars. But, um, you know, it, it, it can be religious in context, but it certainly does not have to be, correct? Not at all. And in fact, the way I think about the spirit is... For me, that's almost the soul of the organization. And probably that could be your cultural elements. You know, I, I'm making association here. But for me, the spirituality of an organization is a lot around virtuousness. And again, traditionally, linking virtuous behavior with organizational behavior is an uncomfortable space for people. But the reality is science tells us Virtuous behaviors huh. are actually at the I core of our cultures. So there's something there. Um, and, you know, when you, again, when you refer to the literature of what makes a virtuous behavior, there are a number of things there that are associated to resilience. There's purpose. So there's flourishing. Uh, you know, purpose, purpose drives your flourishing. There's um, energy. There's vitality. Uh, which is, again, linked to that tribal state. There is enablement. There is a sense of pride. So there are a number of things that are sort of embedded in that concept of virtuousness that's actually bringing a lot of goodness out of people and out of organizations. I love that. I love, And it keeps continuing to, to, to center around, you know, this, this human-centric, human-centered, uh, purposeful, not only leading, but followership, mentorship, all of it, uh, coaching, uh, you know, it's just all interconnected for sure. So your, your next behavior that you discovered out of these organizations that were an imperative was that, that leaders lead for execution and connection. So how is that tied into everything we talked about so far, but how is it different? Yeah, really good question. So I think this is about how leaders are relating to their role. Um, what we found inside these organizations is leaders understand that there is a business element to their core role. Um, so there has to be high quality in terms of what they're executing upon, whether it's operations or strategy, whatever they're responsible with. But they also understood that they should care equally about having high quality connections. Um, and it's not just about them connecting to an individual. This was also about them making connections between individuals, you know, pointing people to Uh say, you need to work with this individual. Or there were examples uh, where they were thinking outside the box and saying, uh, we as an organization actually have to partner with, with, with this nonprofit or this government agency because together we can help grow market share. So they had this... Uh, understanding that they, they, their role entailed a connective tissue. Uh, and so in some ways, yes, they were looking to execute, but they were also looking to make network patterns That's a great <laughs> from phrase. a competitive yep. advantage perspective. It makes a lot of sense because in this new world, it's shared economies, right? Like we actually share to grow together. So... Anyway, uh, it just, it seemed to resonate I, uh, with me. Uh, uh, another great much. point. I must've said that 10 times already in our conversation, but <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I, th- I think a lot of people that are good leaders miss that connection point. I think a lot of leaders try to make an example of themselves. Um, many are servant leaders to where they're like, you know, Hey Sally or Hey Joe, I want you to take this project on and all that. But your point on connection, your point on a leader should be looking throughout their space 
and seeing two other souls or two other departments or two other business units or two other organizations that they could match that would be complementary that could be actually you know the complete opposite of each other but by when combined together make a nice solid uh, potential, all of those kind of things. I think many of us miss that point about how we should be connectors. Leaders should be connectors. Um, and I, that's a great, uh, point of emphasis that I know that I'll bring forward and in, in my coaching, uh, because I think that's often missed in today's environment. I think it was Bill Gates who said, Oh, several years ago now, maybe five years ago, as we look into the next century, mm. so we were sort of at the verge of 21st century, then he said leaders will be those who empower and grow Absolutely. others. And I completely agree with him. So we are not expected to be the smartest in the room anymore. It's, first of all, in this information age, and I actually think we're moving into a wisdom age more than information, but... You can't know everything. It's just not possible. So let's not pretend we're going to have answers for everything. It's really about helping others reach, um, you know, discover a, a level of potential and hopefully perfect. Absolutely. And you too. mentioned growth in there. That's your last behavioral trait here. Is that they're purposeful and growth leaders are purposeful about growth. So when you talk about that. How do you mean in growth? Because we've already said they're taking care of themselves, right? They're they're figuring out how to be them best selves, how to work on their confidence, how to connect others. So where what are they purposeful about in terms of growth? So growth is a terminology I have been working with in a long time now, several years. And um the terminology I'm not satisfied with in a lot of ways because we, so it's not uncommon for us to discuss growth inside businesses, Jim, but the way we understand growth, I think is a bit skewed because we often think about numbers when we talk growth. Um, and there's this almost unconscious and arguably conscious too, expectation that organizations have to grow year over year and yeah. by the way, exponentially, um, individuals are supposed to grow year over year, meaning they have to bring more revenue or they have to hit higher quotas. This is probably one of the sickliest cycles in the history of business. First of all, if you look at growth, uh, there's a great book. I wish I would remember. Um, anyway, if you look at growth, if you study growth in in the world, you know, if you look at nature, if you look at how cities grow, if you look at how cultures grow, how civilizations have grown over the years, none of the growth recorded is exponential. There are peaks at times, so there's exponential growth at times. But what we see today out in the world from trees to cities, they come in a linear growth format. So for us to expect from one another that we have to continuously grow exponentially ha, great is point. actually a bit naive. So inside these organizations, what we found is leaders were really purposeful about growth, but they were purposeful about sustainable growth in the sense that they made it top of mind to remain committed to learning for themselves but to also help tap and unleash the inner power people and organizations have within them. So it's a different approach to growth. And I think that's the differentiator here and probably the tie. I, I love that. I'm a huge believer in that. I, um, growing up in the military, one of the things that uh, was the beautiful part of the military as a leadership generator was the fact that you only are allowed certain amount of time in the military. And mostly you're even allowed because of its culture in a certain assignment, right? You're always moving around in the military. So there's a culture, there's a subliminal culture of up and out, meaning you are going to move up in the organization or in a leadership position, but you have to go out, you have to leave it. And so in order to make the organization powerful and 
uh, high performing, you have to constantly be working not only on yourself, but those that will follow behind you because it is your inherent responsibility to leave. And uh, that's a growth mindset, believe it or not, right? Like it's it's a leader's responsibility to, in order to grow, I love that you you actually call it sustainable growth. Another point I'm going to steal from you, because by saying sustainable growth, that's the, that's the up and out methodology. That is, you know, make sure for us uh, to continue to grow and to prosper, you've got to be planting the seeds behind you for that next generation to come up. So I just think that's a, that's a powerful uh, behavior to kind of leave as your fifth and final uh, stomp on these five very powerful um, leadership behaviors. When do you believe, I don't want to put words in your mouth, when do you believe someone that's listening to this episode, let's say they just graduated um, graduate school and they're getting ready to enter the workforce, uh, are they saying, well, I'll worry about that later? You know, that's when I start to become a senior manager or when, when are these type of behavior things something that someone should be paying attention to? Well, wow, such a great question. First of all, thank you very much for being caring about our next generation. Um, so here is my humble advice uh, to people who are graduating and coming into the workforce. Uh, and it's a hard one for me to say because I actually come from very humble roots and I was a scholarship student all throughout uh, high school, university, my higher degrees. I think I stopped paying my oh, wow. you know, debts yeah. like only 10 years ago or something. Like that. So, <laughs> yeah, I know what it's like coming out of school, you know, and wanting to make a living for yourself. Maybe you want to get a roof over your head. Maybe you have a loved one and you're wanting to you know, join lives together. Having said that, the biggest help, gift you can give yourself is to choose your first job carefully. And perhaps not go for the big buck, but go to someone you feel you can learn from. Because those behaviors will stay with you, I promise, for a lifetime. I was very fortunate. So I was unfortunate economically um, through most of my life. But I was very fortunate to go under the wings of people who were really good at what they did. And and they taught me a lot of good stuff. Um, And they encouraged me to think differently, to be creative. Um, And I owe them a lot. I wouldn't do it any other way. So this is my humble uh, advice to people to start caring about these behaviors from the very top, from the very beginning. And uh, again, if they feel like they can find a leader they can learn from, people are organically drawn to, that's probably a better job option for them. I think that's fantastic advice. There's no need to be humble about that at all. That uh, That is advice that I think from a global perspective, we can all embrace for sure. And Cecil, I cannot thank you enough for this hour with the Iron Sharpens Iron Leadership Movement. This tribe of listeners grows every single day, and we certainly are passionate about human-centric leading, uh, just like yourself and your organization and your professional peers around you. And this was the fastest hour I've ever had because it was just all goodness, and it's certainly centered around the art and science of leading. So uh, uh, when we've referenced this this paper that you've written. And of course, I've said that we're going to do the link. You're also turning that uh, you've partnered with Stanford that you did this uh, research with, and you're actually going to be producing a new book soon too, right? That should be out by the end of the year. Correct. Correct. That's what we're aiming towards. Of course, in this current environment, it's hard to predict what happens when the draft, the draft is finished. It's in copy editing. So cross our fingers. We should have a good book coming out in a couple of months. Fantastic. And we wish you the best of luck ahead of time on that. And I know that we will all be scooping that up as soon as it comes available. And we can find you also on Leadership on Forbes as a, as a pretty uh, uh, consistent contributor uh, for there. And so I will make sure that our links are there. Uh, I know that... Uh, 
we don't want to end this episode, but we will end it now. But I want to reveal to our listening audience that uh, in the near future, there will actually be a second episode with Cecil. And we are going to talk about the new leadership mindsets that, uh, that she has discovered through this uh, journey that she has taken along with herself and her peers. And I think we are going to find just as much knowledge out of that as we have on this week's episode. So Cecil, again, thanks so much for your attention and um, your information that you have given us. It has been educational to say the least. Thank you again. Thank you for having me. And I look forward to the next set of conversation. Thanks for joining our leadership movement this week. Talking to Cecil today about the art and science of human-centered leadership reminds us all that it is always coming down to how you lead yourself and the others around you through connection and caring. Thanks, Cecil, for those poignant reminders. Don't forget, our show notes are posted on our website with key leader takeaways. And be sure to subscribe to the podcast and tell a friend so we can continue to build our tribe together. Join our Facebook group to get even more behind the scenes action and exclusive content for leaders like yourself. And until next time, remember that iron sharpens iron. Make yourself and others around you better every single day.